Today's reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Hello. It is great to see you. This week and next week are our two busiest vacation weeks of the year, so I'm thrilled you guys are here. We started this conference that we did last summer, the summer before, specifically to celebrate all of us who are not going away on vacation, uh, to, to celebrate the fact that Lord is good and we can do great things even if uh, a lot of people are on vacation, so we keep it interesting uh, when people are away. So we're looking at, so this morning I want to remind you, in the morning we're doing Missiology 101 and our 9 o'clock hour for adults, and we have a special VBS thing going on for our, our children on that same hour. So I highly encourage you to take advantage of coming to those things, encouraging people to come, because they are, they are fantastic. Um, we have a lot of things, exciting planned and deep things planned these next three Sundays. So you can continue to come to any one of those, or all of those if you like. Uh, so we're starting our, our little uh, mini-series on uh, its mission <coughs> emphasis. Um, all the texts we'll be looking at are from Acts. Uh, last week, uh, we looked at an Old Testament one to get us ready for uh, what, we're, what we're looking at to set the, the primer. Um, and what we're looking at today, the text we read, is really about revival breaking out, not just uh, a mass conversion, but then revival. Uh, they were converted and they were, there was a revival that started breaking out. And if you've ever seen or experienced what a revival is like, the closest thing uh, in my generation that I've seen would be looking more like what happened in Cleveland when the Cavaliers won the MA Finals uh, after a long drought. There was, there was mass hysteria celebration. Everybody's happy. Everybody loves Cleveland. Everybody, everybody is everybody's brother and sister. They're high-fiving in the streets. Um, that's what it looks like. Or if you're not a sports person, when the person you, you want to run for office wins the election, the date what you feel like the next day, when you find out that the votes are in, your person won, and that next day or week or whatever, you're, you're walking around just feeling, feeling great about life. Well, we're talking about how those things capture what revival feels like, but when we're talking about the gospel, those things are sorely lacking when it comes to true revival. Shows us that the human desires something like that to happen. Um, and we're going to see today how it's only the message of Christ that truly does it the right way. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for this morning and we pray now, Lord God, that you would take this time, make it special uh, and precious because you reveal yourself to our hearts through your words. So we pray that that would happen this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So the first thing we need to talk about is, so what is missions? This is a missions emphasis series we're doing. So really, the way the, 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 the Bible talks about it, missions is about taking the gospel, the message of Christ, to the world. But the Bible says it uses more than just the word world. It says taking it to the world, to the lost, to every tribe, and to every tongue. It's about extending the message of Christ to everyone, everywhere. Missiologists say really the best way to define who's supposed to hear the message is we are to continue presenting the message until every family has had a chance to hear the gospel. Got that? Until every family. We haven't even accomplished that here in Reston, let alone Fairfax County, let alone America or the world. Um, but that's the command. So missions. And so the first question is, um, what is the gospel? All right, so missions is taking and taking the gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel um, is really at its most core level. It's God addressing your deepest need. Your deepest needs is to be connected to him. And so the gospel is about bringing the message of what Christ did on the cross 
and what that, how that translates to your deepest needs. So he's, he's coming. Your deepest and truest needs is what the gospel is here to address. It's for some of us, it's to reveal to you what your deepest needs are. And at the same time, he's there to address them. So where we're at uh, in, in this story is uh, Peter... The Apostle Peter has just preached what we consider the, the first New Testament sermon. And at the end of his sermon, 3,000 people, it says, were baptized and, and put their trust in the Lord. 3,000 people heard the message, weren't Christians, and converted to Christianity. And so what Paul was doing, we talk about the gospel. Missions is about taking the gospel. The gospel is about addressing your truest and deepest needs. And the reason why I'm going to say it that way is for many people, the reason the state where some of us are in spiritually is that we don't really know what our deepest and truest needs are. And we seek out things to, to, to scratch those itches, right? Uh, for example, I recently had to get my car worked on. There was a problem. One of the tires was making noise. And I thought, well, the, what needs to be fixed is just the, the brakes are squeaky. And they looked and said, it's not the brakes. Yes, the brakes do need to be replaced, but so does um, the axle, the front axle. I said, what? That sounds a bit more important than the, the brakes, the tire falling off. Said, yeah, the, the, the axle, the seals, everything's gone inside. I'm going to have to replace the front axle. So the, the deeper problem was something I didn't even know existed. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a part of the car. <laughs> and it was much more scary than just replacing one front side brake. In the same way, the gospel message is coming to not just tell you you need to be fixed, but that the problem is deeper and worse than you can imagine. You don't even know how bad it is, is what the gospel is telling you. Your wickedness, your, your unrighteousness, your desire to move away from God is deeper than you can imagine. And the solution, though, is far sweeter and far greater than you could ever hope. And that's what the gospel is. So Peter preached that message, and 3,000 people came to faith. And this is where we pick up in the text, is right after that moment, right after this happened. Um, uh, John Stott said, basically, what's happening here, if you think of of the, the church is a big family. It's like all of a sudden, you're a kindergarten teacher, and all of a sudden, one day you had no kids, and the next day, 3,000 kids showed up in kindergarten saying, teach us. Um, this is what happened. It was 3,000 people who, who might have known something about the Old Testament, but their teaching of Christ was, was, this was new. They were new Christians. And this is where we find everyone today. So in verse 42, and it says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. The word devoted, uh, the word devoted means an earnest, regularly practicing all of these things. It wasn't just the disciples' teaching. They were devoted. They were earnestly practicing following the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and prayers. Now remember, what the gospel message is, is... And when it talks about, we're going to be looking at all four of these weeks, is how, if you look at how, so at verse 41, so those who received this word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is going to end here, day by day, the Lord added to their numbers. Each week, what the connection from all the sermons is, the different way God talks about people getting saved, the different way he phrases it, um, how God, so today it's God added to their number. It's saying those are people who are getting saved. So the gospel message is really about, again, that you need to be saved from yourself. That's why the gospel message is something we need to hear once. We need to constantly hear it. And it's important to know what, how important this gospel message is. Because it means to be saved. Uh, what that, that word uh, encompasses is that he's saving you from, you're being saved from a lost or unbelief. You're being saved from unbelief. You're being saved, saved from false belief. Imagine, if you will, you were drowning in an ocean. And there were an infinite amount of life preservers thrown to you. But only one life preserver would actually take you to the safety of a boat or the safety of a shore. Every other one would lead you further and deeper into the ocean. Which one would you take? You would take the one, hopefully, that leads to life. Well, when we talk about being saved, what we're saying is every human has an infinite amount of things they could believe. But what the gospel message is saying is, but there's only one belief 
There's only one person that will actually take you to safety. And that's the one you want to cling to. So the gospel message is about addressing your deepest need, but also providing the lifeline for you. And the biggest struggle we have as followers, I think, is to let go of the one that's leading to Christ and to grab onto others. And for those of you who aren't there, who are skeptic, your biggest struggle is going to be the fact that you're holding on to other life preservers that you may like a lot. But the gospel message is also that those are bringing you a false sense of security. Have you ever, continuing with the water analogy, have you ever jumped on a floaty that didn't have enough air in it and you jump on it instead of lying on the mat, you just sink to the bottom? That's basically what the gospel is saying in the, the ocean. The ocean you're consumed in is, is sin. It's going to swallow you up whole. And so that's what, how important the message is. That we get it right. And so we're looking now at what they devoted themselves to. To theology, to the teaching, which is the gospel message. That's why I was saying what they were devoted to was the gospel message. To make sure that they understood what it was, the apostles, what it was Christ taught about the message about the Old Testament, about everything, so they would know the right thing to cling on to in this world that was pulling them away. They were told there's only one true God that's going to lead to your salvation. This is how we hold on. This is what it looks like when we hold on. So they were devoted to that. They were devoted to fellowship, which um, scholars love to point out that, that what they were to, this fellowship is a fellowship that's unique to followers of Christ, Right? If you just want fellowship, there are literally secular churches, which is an oxymoron, that exist. You read what they do. There's like it's 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 it's, it's fellowship, but no 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 church, no no religion. We just get together. You can get community. You can join a club. You can start a little group, a book club, whatever. You can get fellowship. What we're talking about here is a special fellowship that only exists amongst those who know Christ. Because immediately, because of Christ. The person next to you you may have no relation to what whatsoever is now your brother or your sister. You can now share things with them on a deeper level than people you knew your whole life who aren't followers of Christ. So this fellowship that we have, koinonia, this fellowship that it's talking about, it's not just hanging out with your people. It's that together there's something special that you have in common that is Christ. That is unique. That is a fellowship you cannot find anywhere else. Which is why it's so important we gather together. Which is why it's so important you know that it um, doesn't matter if you miss church. Yes, because we're missing out on that fellowship and you're missing out on that special fellowship. They were devoted to that. They were devoted to the breaking of the bread. Now, there is a thing at this time called uh, the Agape Feast, the Love Feast. And at the early church, this is a stage what we celebrate as the Lord's Supper was different than this agape feast, but they celebrated at the same time. And so most scholars say, what he's talking about here, because he uses the word breaking of the bread later. In this context here, it's, this isn't the just eating together. Later on, that's what they were doing. But in this context here, this is the special meals. Basically saying they were devoted to the special meals when they got together. They got the meal and the Lord's Supper at the same time. Later on, the church divided the two because they wanted to make sure. There was actually talked about in the New Testament. They said, when you get together, you're eating because you want to be full. The Lord's Supper isn't about your stomach being full. It's about spiritually getting filled. Um, and so they separated the two so you wouldn't confuse them. But here, he's talking about this special eating when you got together. Um, whether it was the agape feast, which was an actual meal, or the Lord's Supper, no way of knowing really what's what we, we knew they kind of did them both at the same time. So they were devoted to doing that, to living life together. And then also, they were both, and it says they were devoted to the prayers. And this is really important, because I've been, I've served in different types of churches, different types of denominations, and and it's the, the plural there is, is significant. And what it's saying is, some people like free form prayer, which is they go to a church. If we read a prayer out loud together, they feel like you force something upon them, and they're and 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 they're like, ah, oh, who? If you're gonna pray, you're gonna pray from the heart, right? You don't you don't when you're talking to your 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 best friend or your your you know your significant other, you don't pull out a thing and write it and read to them. Like you just talk, and so they feel like prayer should be like that. 
And then there are other people who are like, I don't want to sound like a bumbling fool when I come to our Lord. I, want to, I would like to sound eloquent. I'd like to know what I'm saying. And why this is so important here is that commentators are saying what they were devoted to was both. To praying from the heart, just praying, but also praying prayers that they've been taught. So what they were devoted to was, was knowing what the gospel message was because that is, that is the life preserver. They were devoted to this fellowship, this special fellowship they had that only came from knowing Christ. They were devoted to this breaking of the bread and they were devoted to, to doing all these types of prayers when they got together. As another commentator pointed out, Acts 42 is probably the, the most basic form, definition of discipleship we have in the New Testament, in the Bible. Because it talks about what you're doing when you get together, why you're getting together, what it looks like when you get together. But it doesn't end at verse 42. So verse 43, then then we see a response to this. In Psalm uh, 33, verse 8, it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord, that the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We see in verse 43 our response. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So as they gathered together, right, the human side of the equation, what they did was let's get together and just go crazy with, go wonderfully deep with all the stuff that we have now in Christ. And what God did was on top of that, gave them awe. That's a response that only God, you can't fake awe. You can fake it, but awe is actual, it's a real thing. You can pretend it, then it's not real awe. Awe is something that God gives you. In the Old Testament, it's always related to when awe is related to standing, and it's related to the fear of God, which is a combination of what it looks like when you, when you know him. So the thing is, they, as they were honing in on these things, awe was coming upon them. As they dug into getting to know him, and as they dug into connecting with other people, doing the same thing, as they, they drew near through praying and all these things, what happened wasn't a, a heavy burden upon them. What happened was their, their heads began to be lifted up and they were filled with awe. And it says many wonders and miraculous signs were being done. Amazing things started to happen. Uh, we did this morning in this course, um, I showed you a whole bunch of interesting um, uh, 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 information about missions around the world. One of those facts said something like, 63% of all conversions uh, in certain parts of uh, in, in unreached people groups happen through people encountering something miraculous. This isn't just made up stuff from 2,000 years ago. It's happening right now. So the, their human response was to, to draw near. And God said, I'm just going to throw the, the reward for drawing near to him. Remember, as always, the, the reward we get in knowing Christ is Christ. It's not uh, uh, more money in your bank account. It's not your marriage is perfected. It's not your children are all singing and dancing your praises. The reward of following Christ is you are now nearer to him. And he is deeper inside of you and all is welling up inside of you. So verse 44 and 45 um, talk a lot about what, what it looks like when Sanctification, that's, that's a word for being changed. What it looks like when you're now being changed by this awe. Um, remember, the, there, there are idols in our hearts that we're constantly searching after. The idols of, uh, the, this, uh, Tim Keller was famous for saying this, but others have, have, have talked about it. The idol of sex, money, and power are kind of the main idols that men chase after in the Western world. You could even say each city um, has one of these idols that people move to for that, like D.C., People move here by and large because they're chasing after power. Uh, New York, they're, they're chasing after money. Um, in LA, it's, it's, it's the, the sex, it's the, the looks. But there's a little bit of idol worship everywhere. And what we're seeing here is when an idol is destroyed, it changes the way you view everything. And what a great example that Bible talks about how money is the root of all kinds of problems. When the idol of money is destroyed in you, uh, the way you treat it and look at it is radically different. Now, verse 40, uh, 4, 44 and 45 is not a communist manifesto, as some people like to, to think, because it is not neglect, neglect, It's not saying you were required to do this. It's not negating ownership of property. This is just what they did on their own, on their own hearts, which is the way it's supposed to work. And it says this, And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds 
to all as any had need. So it wasn't like they all mandatory sold everything. It's that people were getting together and someone needed something and, and someone else said, you know what, I can do without this to, to help you. Again, what makes this a mass, a, a wonderful is it was not mandatory. Um, it wasn't expected. It was just a generous pouring out. And so it took greed. The gospel took greed and transformed it or redeemed it into generosity. I don't know if your own life, if you've ever seen uh, a deep transformation like that happen, um, but it does happen. And as followers of Christ, you need to trust that it happens. I just don't care about people, Chris. <laughs> I just don't like to sing. I just don't like fill in the blank. I'll never, ever be that bad. That's your heart, your sinful heart, telling you that there's a part where the gospel can't penetrate. I'm talking about specifically where the gospel says this is what you should, this is what it looks like, a gospel, someone who's filled with awe, this is what it looks like, and you're saying, I could never be that person. What I'm telling you is you need to trust Scripture when it's saying this is, the gospel can penetrate anywhere, and it will make you a different person. So let's go um, now to verse 46, and it says this. And day by day, attending the temple courts together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. So what we see them doing here, um, if you read for many, uh, many people in our Reformed tradition, they read verse 42 and say all we need to do is just grow in our knowledge, just hang out with each other, and God will take care of the rest. To do that is to make the, the problem that so many people make, which is you don't read the verses before it or after it. You can get some real interesting theology if you do that. But verse 46 is connected to verse 42, and so they're getting together, they're being transformed, and you know what they, they, they needed to do with that? To meet publicly around everyone else, where everyone was doing their life, where everyone did business, where everyone had fellowship, where everyone hung out day by day. Remember last week I talked about what happens in the life of someone who's, who's transformed is you have this thing called active worship, where it's worship that's making, it's actively changing you, and, it's, and you're bringing this worship everywhere you go. We see them doing that right here. They're bringing this worship with them to the temple courts, so where everyone met. And so they were taking these conversations, they were taking this life, they were taking what was doing, and they were going into the world around them. So if you say verse 42 means all we do is focus on this, God takes care of the rest, you're not, really, you're not reading all the verses. It's that you take that and you bring it out to the world around you. God will always take care of the results. That's always his job. But we see that this expression, this wonderful um, fellowship that was happening, they, they had to take it out to the world around them. And they did it, it says day by day. It means the 24 hours, means from sunrise to sun every day. They would go out and take this new life and live this life amongst the people who didn't have it. Our, our struggle is to turn it into the what I call the gospel bubble, right? The gospel bubble is something we need to all be very careful of, which is you, you only surround yourself with other people who are just like you in the faith, and your whole world is within that bubble, and you no longer know or encounter or interact with anyone outside of that bubble. I was a missionary in London where you can open up uh, an, uh, an almanac and it'll say London, England is 76% believer, but trust me, it's more like 3 or 4% believer. And, you know, you meet Christians day after day who said, I grew up my entire life not knowing a single Christian in my entire village or town, never knowing a single Christian in my entire school. We were ministering in the center of London with all people like that, not many Christians at all. And our church plant was slowly kind of growing. And uh, we, were town, we had a, a meeting with, with one of our, our home fellowship groups. And we started talking about people to interact with. And so you're living in the city of however many millions of people. Uh, we have a church of just about, whatever, 30 or 40 or 50. Um, a home fellowship group of about 10. And we found out that over the course of the year, as we were meeting, that 10 began to stop hanging out with stop doing things, stop interacting with the world around them. To the point within a year, the only people they interacted with on a given week is just the 10 people in that little bubble. And we said, guys, if we have something so great, why are we just sharing it with each other? 
We created a Christian gospel bubble in the middle of a pagan lost city. You would think that's impossible, but it's not. That's our natural, sinful, selfish, that's something selfish we do with the gospel. There's something that's designed to go out. We say it's just for us. It's selfish. And we must purge that from our faith. And now we're seeing them do. They're actively taking it to life and bringing life to the world around them. They're not becoming like the world around them, which is important to understand. That's what we talked about this morning. They would guard. You are to guard yourself. You don't have to become like the culture around you. You are to redeem it by clinging to the gospel before you. But we see them doing that. Now in verse 7, again, the results are the Lord's. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Now that would be short-lived, just so you know. As we keep reading Acts, you'll see that enjoying the favor of the people of being milked freely daily today ended as persecution started. This was a short-lived time when they had free reign to do what they wanted to do. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So day by day, those who were looking at the options in that sea of sin that was killing them were choosing to cling to the gospel hope found only in Jesus Christ. And how they discovered that through the work of the Holy Spirit, how they discovered that were the people of God gathering and devoting themselves to growing and knowing here. But again, what makes this passage important, why I want to show this today is that this part right here was um, administered through those 3,000 kindergartners. God isn't asking us to be the Peter in converting 3,000 with one sermon, although hopefully you guys would love to have that happen to you. But that's kind of hard relatable, right? How often are you going to have a chance to speak to 3,000 people at once? But where I see so many of us here is that this is just normal people getting together intentionally. And that is, should be us. A room the size, I picked a sermon today, we were talking about it, talking about earlier in the week with the church staff. Just the group of people we have right here, right now. If everyone in this room right now just committed to trying to bring one person with them next week, we'd have more people this week than we do on an average Sunday when everyone's here. That's how simple and easy it is. But it's hard. This is the last thing I'm going to say. That crossing that 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 boundary, um, that missional boundary where you're starting to view yourself as, as the one who's holding on to that life preserver and realizing your job is to help other people know that you want to hold on to the same life preserver as them. It's awkward and it's scary. But you have opportunities, small opportunities, like to do this every time. I'll give you an example of saying something kind of outside of the norm. Right? It's totally unrelated to sharing the gospel, but you see where I'm going with this. Probably any given week, you have the opportunity to do something culturally very awkward in America. Either at your office, at home, or at a restaurant, you're talking to someone and they have something stuck in their teeth. And you have to sit the decision, do I tell them there's something in their teeth, or do I not? And you decide not to do it, and you walk away and you're thinking, oh, I hope they're not gonna have anything important because it's really big and right there in their teeth. And sometimes, and you might feel a little guilty, and other times, it's someone you barely know, but you're like, hey, you got something in your teeth. And you're shocked. They're like, oh, thank you so much. They're not embarrassed. They're thankful. That happens to all of us. And what I'm saying is that sharing the gospel feels, believe it or not, feels a lot like that. You feel like you don't know if you should do it. How are they going to respond when you do it? But you find out most of the time when you do actually share them something important, much more important than something being stuck in their teeth, their response is thankfulness and joy. Very few times will home will say, how are you to talk to me like that? I found the same as with the gospel. Very few times has someone been aggressive or negative to me for sharing. Very many times have people been thankful, at least appreciative, that I shared. In this story, in Acts, you guys need to be that people. The ones who are devoted, devoted to the word, devoted to prayers, devoted to the sacraments, devoted to Christ, getting to know him, to each other, and taking that joy of knowing that you are going to arrive safe on the shore to the world around you. 
So your day-to-day -day worship, those of you who know Christ, what does your day-to-day -day worship look like? Who is it focused on? Christ or yourself? And for those of you who are skeptics or seekers, please understand that you may think you know what you need in this life, but like my car that had a deeper problem I didn't even know about, the gospel message is telling you, telling your friends, that the problem goes deeper and the only solution is the gospel. So the challenge is laid before you. Will you take this message out to the world around you? Will you look to do that? God handles the results. But he is saying, why would you have something so good and keep it all to yourself? It's time to pop the gospel bubble that many of us are living in. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray now that what we are most excited about is your holiness. What we are most excited about is drawing near to you. Lord, help us to be people who crave to be near to you. Where we are devoted, Lord God, where you want us to be devoted, and we are purging the things you want us to purge. We can only do this through the work of your Holy Spirit. So we pray now, Lord, that you would do that in our hearts. And we do ask, Lord, that day by day you would add to the numbers in this church and all the churches around the world that proclaim you, day by day, those who are being saved. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.